it's like, and you are, but you bided your time to, to find the perfect, literally the perfect yeah. company to join at the, at just at the right time. And were there, you know, moments two years in or four years in where you're like, oh man, this company is really interesting, but you said no for whatever reason. And if so, why did Pinterest make you say yes where other companies? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. So I think like the key was that I was never, you know, people say that like for career decisions, like it's about running towards something, not running away from something. And for me at Bessemer, like I was just really happy. Like, you know, you're, you're always learning, like it's challenging. Like I was working with this incredible person, Jeremy Levine. So I was just, you know, being mentored to be like a great VC. Um, and, and there were definitely companies that came around who, that we invested in or that I got to know that would try, you know, that would start to get to know me and be like, hey, like, do you ever think about being on the other side? Um, <clears throat> but for me, like, I wanted to, like, there was something in me that always wanted to be part of a company, but there was never a company that I just felt as much of a fit with um, and as excited about as it was for Pinterest. And so what happened is like, you know, it was like every year I was just like, oh, well, that was another year at Bessemer. Like, that was great. I learned this. And then, um, and then it was Pinterest that finally got me to be like, wow, like, number one, I just, I love the product. Like, from the very beginning, that's what I saw in the company was that I was just, <coughs> excuse me, just like totally in love with the product. And then what happened is I got to know the team and I was working with the team. And, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. No, you're okay. Um, I, uh, as I was spending time with the team, I was like, one, incredibly impressed by Ben and the founders. <coughs> and, um, and two, the culture of the company. And I just realized there was so much I could do on the inside that it got me to make the jump. And why did you, you know, how, what did you see in Pinterest or, or why did other people miss Pinterest? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think that it's, a, it's a tricky question to answer. So <clears throat> I think that when there are a lot of the same people looking at companies, and what I mean by that is like, look, I was a different person. Like, I was one of the few female VCs that were out there looking at consumer companies. <clears throat> and when you have a lot of the same people looking at companies, you often reach the same decision. And you're laughing at me because I'm clearly like at the very yeah, um, holding back, holding back my coughs. But um, I'm laughing at the chat. It says first VC to die during live chat. <laughs> That's great. Um, <laughs> Someone brings Sarah as a tea or ginger ale. Yeah, I see Where's the green cough drop? I'm, uh, no, you're good. No, thankfully I'm not getting you guys all infected. Yeah, someone brings their and, tea or ginger ale. And, and I, I would, I would be talking to stall you, but but you have all the interesting things to say. Like no, no one's here to see me talking. You know. um, um, but so look, like with Pinterest, I think that, I think that you know, I um, I think that like there was just something for me that clicked in the product that didn't click for other people. Um, and you could call it, you know, you could call it all types of things. You could say it's gender. I actually think that a big part of it was having a prepared mind. So for me, like I was, <coughs> I had spent a lot of time in e-commerce. Um, I was working with a company called diapers.com, Bessemer was an investor, a couple of other companies in the space. And then also was always looking at social, like what were the new and emerging communities that that were coming up. And the one that like what always struck me was that there was no community that was kind of like that overlap of commerce and social. And there was nothing where there was nothing that you could find where there were people talking about objects or you know things. Um, and so when I saw Pinterest, like that was the first time where I was just like, oh my God, here's a company that is doing something in this space that I was quite excited about. And there were a couple other companies that I saw. There was supply, there was the fancy, but I felt like Pinterest was the only one that had really figured out what the product instantiation should be to go after this opportunity. And so I think having that prepared mind really actually 
made me see the opportunity in Pinterest um, that maybe other people missed. And before digging into Pinterest, I've heard uh, you know, VCs talk about how they, you know, the advice that they get is to build uh, expertise in a subject area. Uh, why did you pick e-commerce or did, was it just natural? You know, actually what happened is that um, there was another colleague of mine who was starting to dig into e-commerce. And what we were just seeing is that we would talk to all these companies and they were just crushing it. Like there were so many companies in the e-commerce space that were just growing really quickly. And when you see that, <coughs> it makes you like really think, gosh, there's gotta be something here. Uh, by the way, I'm happy to take a, a, a break if you wanna get some tea or <laughs> water. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, no, no worries. All right, I'm back in action. <laughs> now you're now exactly uh, okay, you continue. I want to make yeah, I want to make you look. Let's uh, all cough it uh, out. Thank you. I'm down. All right. <clears throat> all right. Yeah. Um, by the way, Sean is the inventor of, of Blab. If you haven't already oh, met awesome. him, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Blab is you got to meet him. Blab is a, a hell of a platform. Um, okay, so let's get back into uh, into Pinterest. Okay, you develop this e-commerce experience. You're going to Pinterest. Uh, you see it for reasons other people don't, you know, potentially it has something to do with, with gender, also to maybe something to do with, like, it just wasn't okay, right. hyped in the valley. Yeah, it wasn't hyped in the valley yeah. as much as, like, other things are because the valley wasn't maybe the core users of it. Um, what When you think of Pinterest, and you were there, you know, a lot of the scaling time, like, take us through what it's like to be at a hyper-growth, hyper-scaling company. Uh, and how your role, you know, has evolved, evolved yeah, over time. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, it's, you know, if you're aligned with the culture and you're aligned with the leadership, there is like no better experience to have. Um, <clears throat> you know, like when I joined Pinterest, Ben, I remember like, it was basically all engineers, um, designers, uh, a couple of people on the community side. <clears throat> and so I was really one of the first people who, um, wasn't like a, a builder necessarily. Like I wasn't someone who could like go into the code and build. And I kind of like, when I talked to Ben about my job, I was like, well, what, like, <clears throat> what do you want me to even do? Like, I'm really excited. I want to do this, but like, what's my job going to be? And he was kind of like, you know, you're, you know, it's like, I look, you're going to be a utility player. I have a lot of challenges. I need someone who's smart to kind of come in, put structure around the problem solve it and move on to the next problem um and and so like you know that was my job in the beginning and it's, it's funny like my my title was like i you know stupidly tried to negotiate my title but it ended up just being like business specialist so it was like <clears throat> the lowest rung of the ladder like i was like a vp at a venture firm and i was coming in as like this business specialist uh role <laughs> um but it's like that um the advice that eric gave cheryl sandberg like if you get a seat, don't ask what seat, just get on the, on the rocket ship. And that's like exactly what happened to me. So, you know, the amazing thing about being in a hyper growth company is that there are so often, so, like there are so many problems and so many things that we need someone to do <clears throat> that like all the time, you're just like, oh shit, someone like, who's going to product manage this? Because like, we clearly need a product manager. It's like you look around the room and you're like, who's going to do it? And it's like, all right, Sarah, you do this. And, you know, and like, that's like, that's what happens. And so, you know, I was someone like, I remember when I was, when I called Ben and asked for a job, I kind of pitched myself as a BD person because I felt like that was the only skill I had from venture capital that was transferable into a company. But in my heart of hearts, I wanted to do product. Like, that's what I wanted to do. And I was just lucky that because we were growing so quickly and I understood the product that an opportunity came around where I could like, hey, someone needs to do like localize the product. Oh, okay, I'll do that. Oh, great. Hey, we're thinking about private boards. Can, can you do that? Like, oh yeah, that, and that was like my first product thing. And then like the, the engineer who was leading search and we had no, no PMs on, on search was like, hey, Sarah, 
can you be our product manager? And so like before I knew it, like I had become a product manager. Um, and, and like that, that type of stuff, like, you know, you would think of search um, as like this, the most technical team at Pinterest, and it probably was outside of <clears throat> most technical product team, I should say. And here I was a philosophy major taking, taking that job. Like again, would never get hired from the outside to do the job. But when you're on the inside and you're building the relationships and you like know the product and you know everybody um, and you have like that trust and credibility, you just get you get opportunities that you're that you're in no way qualified to do. And that's that's what happened to me through my time at Pinterest. And so, you know, by the end of my time at Pinterest, like <clears throat> I had I had done a few acquisitions. I was leading, you know, four teams on the product and um, all on the discovery side. Um, I had closed our Series C financing, which was a hundred million dollar financing. Like I just got to do all these things that um, I only would have gotten to do if I was at a company that was growing as quickly as Pinterest was. And you, you did Corp Dev. You acquired a few companies. Yeah, that's too. right. Is that less fun than VC? Is it more fun? What, what, yeah, that's like? a good question. <sighs> so I think it's less fun than VC. Um, so corp dev, like corp dev is kind of like doing VC within a company. And when you're doing corp dev within a company, so I like, I took a bit of a detour. Like at one point I was, they were looking for someone to lead corp dev at Pinterest. And I was like, oh, well, you know, maybe that's what I should do. Like, that's what I'm actually qualified to do. So I started to do it. And what I ended up feeling like was it was, it's a lot of fun because Instead of having to, like, if I try to do a deal, like, Eric, if I want to invest in Product Hunt, I'd have to convince you on why you should have me as your board member. And, like, why, and, like, Greylock, but really it's about me. <clears throat> but when you're at a company, you get to sell your company. Like, so I get to say, Eric, like, you, you and Product Hunt should really join Pinterest. These are the reasons. And because I was so passionate about Pinterest, I really loved doing that. But I also felt like corp dev was kind of on the outside. Like when you think about where are the big decisions getting made in the company, um, like how are we just determining the strategy? Um, at least at that stage at Pinterest, corp dev was kind of on the outside. It was more like I was trying to figure out other people's strategy and then um, enable that strategy, uh, which, which to me felt not as much fun, which is why I moved back into product. Um, but when you're on the outside, when you're in venture, uh, you actually, you are much more core. Like what you're doing is kind of, you're determining your own strategy. Like you're almost more like a, your own startup. Um, and so I find, I find venture to be more fun that way. And you talked about, or this with me, the product being a great, uh, kind of entryway into venture in terms of like the skills. You oh gain. yeah. 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 I mean, How so I think like, um, and so this is just Eric and I were talking and I, I had told him about why I thought being a product manager was actually a great, yeah, as, as you said, entryway into venture. It's because like when you think about the skills you need in a company to be great at product, they're not that dissimilar from what you need in order to be an effective venture capitalist. And so, you know, number one is like, <clears throat> you have to be actually like as a PM, you have to be really analytical, a good communicator, because you're like putting product docs together. You're trying to get other and like other people on your team to see the vision you see for what you want to build. Um, and, and, and then like convince them that that's the right thing to do or like, you know, shuck and jive with them and figure out like, okay, you're right. That I wasn't thinking about that. Like, let's get there. And so you're, you're kind of doing this like iterative process. But a lot of the time, like you're the one that's determining the vision um, through people's input. But then at the end of the day, determining the vision and like trying to reflect the company strategy back into what you guys are going to build. And then you're affecting that change. But because you as a product manager actually typically don't have anybody on the engineering or design side uh, reporting to you. And you have to get the CEO who, or the head of product to agree with what you want to build, um, you have to just be really good at persuasion and influence and um, communication in a way that, um, without having any direct controls. When you think about venture, like 
you know, venture, like, first of all, I'm having to meet with companies and then I have to figure out, like, do I believe in the, like their vision and like, and often that maps to my own views on the space. But then I have to like convince people internally at Greylock, hey, I think this is a great investment. In the same way that I would have said to Ben at Pinterest, hey, I think this is like the right thing, the right product thing to build. Like the 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 way that you kind of say, like, I, I believe in this investment or we should build this product is actually the same. It's like, what are your hypotheses? How do you think things are gonna like evolve in the space? Um, you're like the data supporting that. And like where you go from there is different, but but like that that like mindset is very similar. And then like you have to affect change at the company sometimes without really having direct control. It's not like I can tell the CEO what to do. Like the CEO, it's his or her company. Um, and really you're just trying to persuade them or think through a problem together uh, in a way that's quite similar to being in product. Yeah, I want to get to kind of broader career advice before going even more yeah. specific in the time of Greylock or in your goals there. One, so first off, how did you get the Bessemer gig coming from a philosophy <laughs> major? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think like for me it was, so in college I had the most random job experiences. Like I don't, I mentioned I was selling ads. Um, I like sold, I just was like, I realized I was great at selling ads. So I would sell ads to local businesses for like any publication I could get my hands on. Like there was like the stupidest thing I ever did was there was one company that had these dry erase boards and like the amount of white space was like this big. And then I sold ads all around the perimeter. So it was like, it was like the worst product ever. Um, but like what I just realized was like, okay, I know all these local businesses now because I sold once to them. And so I could just keep on selling to them different products. Um, and the same thing, like starting this general contracting business, like I just would go door to door and like knock on people's doors and like sell them on letting me paint their house or like, you know, fix their roofing, whatever it was. And so that type of background as was like so random, like I'm, I never applied to McKinsey, but I'm sure if I did, they'd be like, what is this person doing? But it turned out that that was like the analyst job in a venture firm is all about cold calling startups. Like, I don't know if any of you guys are founders. Um, I'm sure Product Hunt probably gets these emails like, you know, the junior person cold calling a CEO. Um, that's exactly the same as me trying to sell ads to a local business. And so I just I had this incredibly random like work experience that was not a fit for any other job besides like a VC analyst job or like being in part of a company. So that's how it all worked out. Right. Uh, and how did, how did you convince them? Um, well, I think that I just convinced them by showing number one that I wasn't a, like, I was just fucking persistent. Um, like I was going to get on the phone with any of these founders yeah. or email them constantly and just do whatever I needed to do to get on the phone with great companies. So I think that's like what you look for. Um, when yeah. you're hiring for that role. Um, and then number two, like that I was just a smart learner um, and that I was gonna do whatever I needed to do to learn technology, even though it wasn't actually part of my, 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 any of my experiences. Yeah. Uh, and then from Bessemer to, uh, you know, this idea of getting, you know, getting on a rocket ship, no matter what seat it is, yeah. you agree with that philosophy? I absolutely do. I mean, look, there's caveats to it. You have to feel aligned with the culture and you have yep. to, <coughs> excuse me, you have to trust the judgment of the, the CEO and founders. Cause like there are, you know, in the company you realize how important the CEO is because the CEO is making decisions constantly. And if you don't, believe in the CEO's ability to make the right judgment calls there, then you're gonna, you're just gonna, you're gonna spin out. And so I think like, if you have an opportunity to join a rocket ship and you feel aligned with the culture and you feel aligned with the, like the judgment of the CEO and the founders, then absolutely go for it. You can't go wrong. So the two kind of questions to get nuanced at this philosophy is, 
one, uh, at what's, when is it too late to join a rocket ship? If it, mm. like, when do you optimize to join the rocket ship? And maybe it's as early as possible. But the second question is, how do you identify a potential, you know, what do you look for yeah. in, a, in a potential rocket? How does one know that it's- That's a, that's a, gosh, that is like, if you, if we, if I could answer that question, I will become Midas list number one. Um, but, um, but so I'll, I'll attempt. So number one, like, when is it too late? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. So I've met people who joined Google when it was like 1,000 to 5,000 people. And obviously, like, they just had incredible experiences, right? Like, they learned so much and they got to, they got to, like, you know, they spent four years and they saw it go from like, you know, 1x to 10x, you know, like, it's just like an incredible opportunity. And so, I think for people like joining Uber now, like, I mean, sure, the company is big, but wow, I just feel like there's there's so much more that can happen there. And there's so much that you'll learn that I don't know if there's ever a too late. I think that um, you do become more sensitive to what the role is, the bigger the company is, because you just want to make sure that you're going to be positioned in a part of the org that is growing quickly. Um, that's that's like important because you know like when I joined Pinterest and it was about thirty people we like we barely had an org chart like we kind of all reported to Ben like it was just like you know uh, it was just very different whereas I see you know when I left Pinterest and it was about you know six hundred six hundred fifty people you know when you get into a role <clears throat> you have opportunities to go up in that role like you're gonna have growth opportunities more so than a later stage company but 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 like moving around in roles becomes harder um and so uh so i think picking the right part of the organization becomes more important um in terms of uh in terms of like picking the ones i think that i would um i think it's hard it's really hard to know but there are a few things that you should that you should be you should be asking companies when you when you meet with them. <clears throat> Number one is, of course, like just kind of user growth, um, looking at things like App Annie to see where the company ranks. Um, to like, I actually look at Google Trends to see how people like whether searches for a particular brand are are growing. Um, and then three, like, look, you know, you don't want to. I, I don't. There are, VCs can be. We can make pretty bad decisions, but it's often a pretty good signal if either a, a strong VC has recently invested or there is financing momentum. And like, look, this is this is a very noisy signal, um, but it's it's worth it's worth looking for. Um, again, it depends on what stage of the company though you'd be joining. Yeah. So so you say Uber is not too late. So something like Slack is definitely not. Too oh late. my God! Right. Like Slack. I mean. Like Slack is, you know, there are like Slack product. There's just, it feels like there's so much more that can happen from where Slack is right now. Um, that, uh, that, yeah, like I think it could be a really, I mean, talk about an exciting company. Yeah, I love Slack. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> when people tell me like, what's the newest cool thing? I still say Slack. Really? <laughs> it's not new. Yeah, it's yeah, great, just... I think it's, there's so much and like, yeah. Uh, talk about and like great founder great culture oh, yeah. like there's just a lot great of love goodness there um okay let's get into so as you were before getting specifics of bc you know you had a relationship with graylock or graylock reached out yeah. but you could have had your seat at you know a number of different excellent venture firms mm -hmm. obviously graylock's one, one of the best but how did you kind of how did you think about it was it just you had the relationship let's go did you shop a little bit did you you know take us through that process? yeah <clears throat> I think like, um, you know, so I was, when I was at, at Pinterest, um, I was kind of like this, uh, I hate to use the word unicorn because it's, uh, it's obviously means more uh, now, but I was like this person who, like when venture firms were thinking like, oh, we want to bring on a new, a new partner, a new consumer partner, like what are we looking for? They'd be like, oh, it'd be great if they had prior venture experience, like, oh, if they have prior venture experience that with some good investments, that's even better. And oh, it'd be awesome if they had like 
product experience at a hot consumer company. Um, and so as you can imagine, I was like one of these rare people that like checked all the boxes. Um, and so there were a lot of firms that I got to know. Um, and, and none of them though, like none of them made me feel like I want to leave Pinterest. Like I loved Pinterest. Like it was just, it's just an incredible company. Um, but then what happened is like, you know, Greylock reached out to me. Um, and, uh, and as I, and I, you know, it's funny, they played me so well. They were like, I, I would, for all these VCs, I'd be like, look, thank you for reaching out. Um, I'm just, I'm not interested in leaving Pinterest. And, and they'd all be like, totally get it. Like, when you're ready to leave, just reach out to us. We'd love to have the conversation. I was like, okay, great. And then uh, Greylock was like, totally get it. But hey, do you want to meet like Reed Hoffman or you know, David C or like John Lilly or any of the people? And and uh, and you just kind of like, I'm not going to say no to to meeting with like anybody on the Greylock team, right? Like it's this incredible group of people. And then you meet with the people there, and you realize what an incredible group of people it is. And it's like, to me, like what I realized I was looking for was number one, like I want to, I want to be like a great investor. I want to be one of the best. And so <clears throat> I want to, in order to be the best, you, it's, it helps a lot to be working with the best. Um, the second thing was though, that I, I didn't want to just be an investor. I really want to be like a great board member. Like I, I kind of see my KPI as, what percentage of companies that I invest in will I be the first person that the CEO thinks to call when something happens? Um, and I felt like Greylock stood in a class of its own in terms of thinking actively about working on behalf of the companies, being a great board member. That so I, it just made me feel like I would learn that from the Greylock team in a very special way. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there was another thing, which was like, for me, culture, like I, um, I am very bad with assholes. Like I, I just don't, I, um, I wish I had more arrogance, but I don't. And so I find that like, I just have a hard time working in places where that is part of the culture. And there's just none of, of that at all at Greylock. Like it's a super smart, unassuming group of people, um, that just want to, like help and learn and and make great investments um and so there was something that felt very special about the fit for me with Greylock that I, I realized that for me Greylock was the only firm that would get me to leave Pinterest that that's that's really how I felt and so I mean don't get me wrong I anguished over the decision it was it was a very hard decision to leave but um but ultimately um realize that it was just one of these things that I, I couldn't say no to. And so I, I pulled the trigger. Yeah. And let's talk. Uh, well, actually, I think before getting I guess, into venture again, the idea of, you know, you're at something that's fin fantastic, um, but evaluating other opportunities, it's a very delicate situation, obviously, is, you know, there's this one saying, I think it's in relationship, which start, but you're only as faithful as your options. Like, does that relate to you know, the, the converse of when to join a rocket ship, but also when to leave if a rocket ship is, you know, no longer a rocket ship or, or there's a bigger rocket ship. Like, what is, you know, kind of the etiquette around, and what are your thoughts there as you advise, you know, younger younger people, you know, whether to uh, to move on, to, you know, join something like Slack or, or, or hmm. VC or... And what was the saying, you're only as, what as your options? Faith, faithful, faithful as your options. Huh? Um, <clears throat> so I think that, the number one advice I give to people is that a lot of people will will say like, hey, you know, I'm thinking of leaving Pinterest. Or I'm thinking of leaving this company or, you know, I and like maybe I'll do a company. Maybe I'll I'll join another company. Maybe I'll do VC. Like and there's always this this kind of theoretical conversation. And my advice always is like, <clears throat> look, in order to make a decision whether or not you want to stay at the company. You have to see whether there are tangible opportunities outside the company that will get you to st that that excite you enough that you want to make the change. Um, and so, like, I, I think, like, I I've seen this a lot where people will say, like, even you know, people at Pinterest will be like, 
I'm thinking of leaving, you know, I'm hitting my four years soon, blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, well, do you want to leave just because you're hitting, like, what are the reasons behind, like, do, do you want to leave just because you think you should leave because you're hitting your four years? Like, you know, so like getting down into the real reasons why someone's thinking of leaving, um, because I think you shouldn't do, you shouldn't leave somewhere because you think you should. You, you like, I've heard people be like, oh, you know, I don't want to be one of those people who worked at a company for six years. Like, why not? That's like an incredible thing to do. Um, so that's number one. And then number two is like, okay, well, make something tangible, like see whether you will get excited enough about another opportunity that it'll make you want to make the move. Um, but I think for some reason, like people think that it's like, looks bad to be in the company for a long time, which to me is the silliest thing. Like there are the opportunities that you get when you're in a company for several years is, is just completely different. Like your impact. I feel like I started to be most impactful at Pinterest, like, or not just me, actually, I should say people become much like so much more impactful at Pinterest or any company after they've been there for really a year. Right. Um, cause you've like know all the players, you have the institutional knowledge. Um, and so to like then leave before, like, you, you can imagine that it's like this exponential curve, I think, of your impact as you become more and more established in the company, you have more and more institutional history. And so for people to leave as they're starting to be most impactful, that's silly. Um, but, right. but, um, but you just have to, you have to make it tangible. And why, you know, after a few years of Pinterest, you, you said you wanted to be a great investor. Why be a great investor? Uh, why would that over... Mm -hmm being a great operator and starting your own thing? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, for me, this is very personal, which is that I, um, I, I want to do what I'm going to be best at. Um, and for some reason, I think this is what I'll be best at. Um, like, I think that this is what, um, this is where I can have as the most impact um, and how and, and, and be the most effective. Um, and so, so that was, that's what it came down for, for me. And I also feel like venture though, is the type of thing where you're not, no one's good at it out of the gates. Like <clears throat> there's a saying that it takes a hundred million dollars to train a VC. I actually don't think it's that dour, but it is like when you look at the most successful investors, I mean, gosh, like look at Bill Gerlich, he's obviously been an incredible investor, but probably his best investment ever was Uber. And this guy's been doing this for how long? Like, so, right. you know, you have VC is, VC, like people used to think of VC as something that you do later in your career. And I actually think that's no longer the case. I think that the best investors start doing VC much earlier in their career than has historically been the case. Um, and, uh, and so I just felt like if I want to be the best, I just got to get started doing it. Um, and that's, and that's what got, that's, that's kind of what catalyzed it also. Cool. So you've been at Greylock for a few months. Yep. Uh, you're now in, you know, transitioning from operator mindset to investor mm -hmm. mindset. You want to be a great investor. You want to be, you know, the, one of the best, the best, how, you know, you want to learn how to be great on board. <laughs> how do you, what's the education of a VC like, you know, take yeah. us through how you are trying to, you know, to be the best investor you can be in and what you're trying to learn and who you're learning it from. It's a great question. By the way, I'm like, I feel like this, this uh, podcast is going to come to haunt me now that I've publicly declared my <laughs> desire to be the best. But, um, but so, and look, that's just who I am. I'm, I'm a pretty competitive person. Yeah. I just want to always strive to be better. Um, so in terms of like how you learn, like, honestly, I mean, gosh, venture has the longest freaking learning, like, like feedback cycles out of like one of, I mean, just about anything like, um, and so you have to, like, if you're going to try to do it by yourself, you're going to make so many mistakes and ex and you're like, it's so easy to make mistakes. It's like you're the velocity of making mistakes is faster than your velocity of learning in some ways, because you don't really know, whether your investment was good or bad for like five years, if not more. Mm -hmm. And so the way to bootstrap that learning is to work with an investor who has already gone through the learning curve um, and has been doing it for 10, 15 years. 
Um, and that like, and then you have someone who already has this patterns, um, already has the learnings, and you can talk with them, um, talk through a company with them. You good? And so with that, is that Josh Elman? Is that John Lilly? And I want to make a brief, brief analogy, actually. I'm curious, like, if we compare it to poker, for example, you know, uh, and I was sitting with the World Series champion of poker, and he was explaining, him or her was explaining to me their process. Uh, I'd be like, yeah, okay, I can learn a ton, but at the, at the end of the day, is it kind of like poker? And, and maybe I'm just not giving poker enough credit. <laughs> you mean, is, is, uh, is the process of investing poker? No, just in terms of the, like, luck involved. Oh, like, how yeah. much... Um, <laughs> you know, is it expertise well, versus, you know. So I think it's um, it's actually a pretty good analogy in some ways because poker is, I mean, look, people who play poker say it's a game of skill, right? Right. <laughs> but at the same time, there's sometimes the the last card in the flop, and you're like. I just got it on the river, right? Like you're just, you just got so fucking lucky. Like this, the statistics were against you and you got so lucky, right? And there are definitely companies where you are, you're just flabbergasted that like they got acquired for something. You know, like there are, there are times when a company gets acquired and it was like who, or it goes, like it just takes off and you just, you kind of can't predict sometimes, like it feels like you can't predict. But then at the same time, like that you look at some investors who are just so fucking good at it. And sorry, I'm a New Yorker, I swear a little bit. Um, especially when I have a cold. I think I get a free pass for, for swearing. Absolutely. Cold. Um, yeah. But um, there are just some people who are so good at it and they figure out the right moment to invest in a company that it makes you feel like, it's not just luck and it's definitely not just luck. I mean, there is, it is such an art. It is so hard to be good at investing. Um, and if you are hoping to get lucky, you're screwed. Like if you're hoping to get lucky or you're just like, Hey, it could work. Someone will want to buy this. Oh my God. That yeah. is, that is a bad, that is a bad path. And so it's kind of like, if you were a poker player, like hoping to get lucky on the river, like you're going to lose your money. Right. Who, uh, what makes a great board member? Hmm. Like what, what skills does one need? What's the you know ideal board member? Yeah. I mean, look, so <clears throat> if I think I, I, I am going to make numbers up here, but I think that there's like <clears throat> some percentage of board members. So number one is do no harm. Um, <clears throat> and I, gosh, there are so many board members who just – just like just by following do no harm would 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 be more effective board members um but you see do no harm you see investors doing harm <clears throat> when they try to micromanage the the company or they they don't trust the ceo um or they <clears throat> put their interests way too far ahead of the company's interests when it comes to transactions or um, financings, et cetera. So there is, there is number one, do no harm. But then I think <clears throat> it is, there's like probably two places, <coughs> sorry, you guys. Um, there are two places where an invest, like there's kind of, there's, there is number one, okay, day-to-day -day operating of the business. Like where, how can a board member help? Um, and I think that there's like a bunch of ways where a board member can be valuable there. There's, there's um, helping to recruit. There's like helping to sell new, new uh, people that the company is talking to on like, you know, closing them. Um, there is figuring out like strategic introductions you can make. Um, and then there's just like the day to day of like talking with the founder, working with the founder, asking questions, being a truth seeker, like to make sure that the founder doesn't have blind spots um, and also isn't too much in the weed that they're, they're picking themselves up. So there's like, there's a lot of coaching um, and just help you can do to remove, remove roadblocks. Um, and then I think like another huge, huge, huge part of the investor, like a great board member 
is maximizing some of the most important moments for a company, which is financing and exits, right? So, you know, oftentimes like, you know, venture, like VCs, we're deal, we're deal makers, right? Like we're doing deals all the time. And so oftentimes a founder like should only go through a financing process, you know, a handful or two times in their entire careers, right? And so if a VC can add value during those important moments, that's incredibly valuable. And then lastly, like when it actually comes to the exit of the company, um, whether that's thinking about like M&A strategy and, and maximizing that or thinking about, you know, timing for a public offering, I feel like an investor, a great board member should be able to add a lot of value in those in those like incredibly crucial moments. Mm -hmm. And how important is is uh, is marketing today hmm. for for VC? Like like being out there, you know, the bounce. You know, uh, Andreessen Horowitz coming out on the scene just in a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. But also, you know, some people are you know Sequoia benchmark a bit more reserved. Where's your stance on how important it is today, and where's your stance on where you personally? It is so it is so important. I mean, it's like a. It's become like when I started at Bessemer, uh, which was in 2006, you know, it was just a different world. Um, there are very few investors that were blogging, um, very few firms that had a marketing person. Um, you know, it is just different. And, and now look like <clears throat> there is companies, especially companies that are growing quickly have so many choices. Like it used to be that a company growing quickly in the Valley had maybe a handful of people that they like should talk to. And now there's like so many amazing investors in the Valley. And so if you want to be the person that someone thinks about when they're looking to raise money, you have to get your name out there. You have to be someone that people think about or feel, feel like they want to work with. Um, and people do that with blogging. Like I, I wrote a blog post actually that blogging is like the freemium model of venture. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're kind of like, it's like the five gigabyte free, you know, Dropbox offering where you're like, hey, like here's a taste of how I think. And if you want more, like, you know, let's talk. Like that's what an investment is. Um, and I think that, I think that that's, that's the way the VC game is now. Um, and I think it's so great. Like, to me, I actually think it creates a lot of transparency. Um, it like makes it so that it's not as much of a rich get richer effect uh, for for investors. You know, like there are so many established names in venture as and the people that you would think about, like you know John Dora, like Bill Gurley, etc. Um, but there are a lot of great up and coming people too. Um, and the way that you know someone like a Mark sister who basically came yeah. out of nowhere and was just like a blogging machine and and got so much brand equity from doing that he's he's a great investor now and he was able to to like leap ahead um because he was so good at marketing and so i think it's it's a really important thing it's probably i also think being a great blogger is the most overvalued skill in vc <laughs> um like yeah. the fact that you're good at blogging doesn't mean that you're going to be a great board member or a great investor Right. Um, but, uh, but like, you know, but it, it ends up being pretty important, pretty valuable. So how do you think about it for, for yourself in terms of getting your, is it, is it, you're going to start blogging more actively, yeah. you know, do you, is it like being at all, being at all the main events? Like, how do you think about, because you're just getting back into it, you know, becoming a name that everyone thinks about, you know, besides doing such illustrious things like products. Exactly. And, exactly. And like um, no, I definitely like. I actually love blogging. Like to me, you know, the thing I miss about being in a company is shipping. Like you, um, in a company, like you always, like you're, you're driving towards something <coughs> like shipping a product and, and it feels so tangible. And when you ship something, you're just like, yes, it's out there, like onto the next. Um, and for me, blogging is like the same feeling, um, of like, I've, I have an idea, I'm clarifying it, writing it, and then shipping it. Uh, and it has the added benefit that uh, it starts to get your name out there. Um, so it's something that, you know, I, I, 
I've got to get my act together a little bit more, get get more of a routine there. But like that's something I really want to do. Events are great too. Um, and look, like you're as an investor, especially a new, you know, the new person and a firm, you want to just get out there and have people think about you. Um, and, and events can be quite valuable that way. Um, but I don't know which one's more important, blogging or or uh, events. I'd be I'd be if people had feedback there, I'm I'm totally open to it. Let's talk about uh, gender briefly. It's something that uh, you know it, there's been a lot going on in terms of you know the lack of women in prominent positions at VC firms, and uh, and you haven't talked a ton about it, and maybe that's that's by design. Um, and I'm I'm just curious what you make of it, and maybe there's maybe there's not you know maybe you don't want to talk about it. I don't want to put you in the spot, but just. What what are your thoughts just in general as to how how you view view you know it in your own life and also just the broader economy? Yeah, so like, um, like I I uh, I was gonna make some joke about like, didn't you see this is one of the things that we're not supposed to talk about? But I, I'm just <laughs> totally kidding. So like, look like, you know, when I joined Bessemer, I was the only woman, um, and when I joined. Um, Greylock, I was like the first woman, like first female partner. So like, it's something that I definitely think about and like, you know, it wasn't for me, like for me personally, I actually thought that being a woman was a pretty big disadvantage, uh, until I did the deal for Pinterest. And that was the first time where I realized that actually I bring like a very unique perspective to the table. Um, and having a different, like when you're investing you're always looking for, you know, your unfair advantage, like your edge. Um, and I realized like, holy crap, like for me, <clears throat> if I'm looking at consumer companies, uh, I'm gonna have a different perspective on those companies than, than, than most other people, um, especially just, you know, cause like we're just different. And, and so I like started to realize like what an advantage it is for me. Um, and and I think that sometimes, like I think that people are realizing um, that diversity, whether it's gender or race or like you know origin, is actually is very similar, right? Like we, you know, you make better decisions when you have people. Like at Pinterest, like a big value for us was this thing called knitting, um, which we, which was really collaboration, and we just believe that when you bring people from dis- different disciplines together to solve a problem, you're gonna get to a better decision, a better outcome than if like, it's like the same people solving for the problem. Um, and I just think diversity in general is like the same thing. And I use diversity um, kind of very broadly in this like um, kind of perspectives uh, uh, way of approaching it. Um, and so I think that, you know, well, like, I, like, I personally don't talk about diversity a lot because I just kind of, keep my head down and I just want to kick ass and then be a great example, uh, that way. Um, but, uh, but it's definitely something that, that, uh, I'm, I'm happy that the conversation's happening now in the, in the Valley, at least. Mm -hmm. I want to ask uh, rapid fire questions. Uh, you don't have to have rapid fire answers. (laughs) Um, so, uh, and this goes out, uh, John Exley has asked fantastic questions throughout. So shout out to him. Uh, you know, you're from New York. Uh, entre- if you're an entrepreneur, do you need to be in San Francisco? You know, can you do it? Like, is that the, the recommendation? Can you do it from New York, from LA, or just move to San Francisco? I'm super biased here. I think, I think Silicon Valley is a global maxima. Yeah. I think like. Is there any? Yeah. Uh, is there anyone in the VC world that you uh, envy? Not, I mean, not because of the success, but just for a skill that they have that you wish you had. Hmm. You know, my colleague Josh Elman is freaking yeah, incredible at knowing everybody in the valley. Um, he is just in the flow. Like everybody I speak to is like, oh, I'm like best friends with Josh. And like you know that when everybody's best friends with Josh, like there's just something <laughs> special that he's able to do. Um, and so I like I like, I'm watching him. I'm like, how does he do it? Like, how can I learn? How, how does to he do, do it? That? How is he so good? <laughs> I have no idea. Like, it's amazing. Well, one, I just know he, he takes meetings 
all day long and he's just super yeah. helpful. he's always like texting i mean he's just super helpful yeah, yeah. um it's just some, it's his personality a little bit it's it's great yeah um what advice would you give to your 25 year old self 25 is when I was at Bessemer. Um, moved to Silicon Valley earlier. Mm -hmm. where, where were you? I was in New York. I was gotcha. at Bessemer five years in New York. And explain that out a bit, a bit more just because the, the nucleus of everything that's happening is here. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I really do believe that um, the, the, companies going after the biggest opportunities are here um, and by being here you maximize your chances of going like becoming one of the biggest companies um and so like i believe like if you i mean first of all silicon valley like i love living in san francisco i'm a new yorker but like i just adore san francisco despite the lack of public transportation which is a huge huge pain in the butt um but so like i love living here and i believe that like if you're an actress, you want to be in LA. Uh, and I think if you want to build your career in tech, like you should be here. Mm -hmm. uh, what would and the self some of, caveat yeah. to that? I kind of, I kind of say that like, if you're, if like you're in New York, if you're doing a FinTech company or, you know, a fashion company and you're in New York, like an ad tech company, like there's so many categories where like it makes so much sense to be in New York. Similarly, like if you're doing a content company, like, or there's so many other categories, like, being in LA makes sense. Like there's, you know, there are so many other, there's a lot of nuance to that argument, but overall, I think Silicon Valley is, is, uh, is the best place. What's something uh, that you used to fundamentally believe that you now see as uh, misguided? Uh, meritocracy. Oh, we got, okay. Uh, please elaborate on that. I mean, look like <clears throat> when I, um, I like, I just, my view was always like, oh, if I just work really hard and I like do the best work, like I'm going to be recognized for that. And like, I'll like succeed. It's kind of like, I just viewed life as like, if I get the highest grade on my exam, I'll be the best student. But actually like, there's so much other stuff that comes into play. There's so much subjectivity that I think that a meritocracy is like, it's not, it's an aspiration, but I think that our belief that we have it is misguided. And how would you recommend that people understand the other stuff, which is which is actually is very important? Yeah, I mean, I think awareness is just huge. Like um, people, you know, becoming aware of our our biases, our our unconscious biases, uh, makes a huge huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of there's a lot of great stuff happening on that on that side. When you think of uh, who comes to mind when you first hear the term fulfilled, like someone who is who lives a fulfilled life that, that you want to. Emulate. Oh, wow. That's an intense question, Eric. <laughs> I, I guess I think about my like my my mom. It's amazing. Yeah. It, tell us why. I mean, she's just like. She's this incredible person who's so loving and, you know, like five kids and painting and like kind of, you know, she's just, I just feel like she's a happy, fulfilled person. It's wow. like one, I mean, I, I like, I would love to be her age, you know, and look back on my life and feel the same way that she should feel about hers. That's fascinating. And, and this balance between like being a great investor uh, and success in your personal life, professional life, but also, you know, having the life that you want to have personally, we, we, we end every interview with, what do you want people to say at your funeral? Now oh, that this podcast God. is like, oh, uh, God, mortality. Is... <laughs> um, wow. You really just, you just, you just oh, yeah. like, you just go for it. Um, <laughs> what do I want people to say at my funeral? Uh, <laughs> um, but I guess I was a loving and loved person. That's good. That's a good note to, to end on as well. Uh, before that, uh, you know, one, where can people find out, you know, more about you online? Where can people find out more about 
Greylock, what you're up to, any plugs for upcoming things. And then if you have any advice and or an ask of the products and audience, a lot of the founders, entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs and investors. Um, also, the easiest place to find me is on Twitter. Um, and I list, I like, I think I link to either my Greylock uh, bio or, um, and actually on greylock.com's website, if you look at my bio, I actually have my email address listed there. So feel free to, to drop me a note or connect on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever. You're about to get flooded. <laughs> um, I can't guarantee quick responses, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but I um, look like, you know, my job now is uh, to meet with awesome founders and uh, find like the next, the next great companies. And so that is, if, if, if you are someone who you know who's super talented and working on something interesting, like, um, you know, you know where to find me. Mm -hmm. I'm consumer Perfect. series A, series B. Awesome. And any uh, advice or an ask of the product and audience as they you know, want to be founders, want to be investors? Oh, any advice on founders? Oh, God, it, it's hard to... It's hard to um, give uh, some generic stuff there, but you know, tweet at me at pin, on Twitter, and I'll I'll follow up. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to give a big shout out to you. Thank you for coming. So uh, even so sick uh, as you are, thank you. You for, are a trooper for surviving my coughs, you guys. I know it's yeah. probably pretty annoying, and I definitely saw a couple comments that said. Somebody give her a box of zinc gluconate lozenges. Like, yep, that's that's pretty accurate. Um, but anyway, thank you, you guys, for for uh, for joining me for this. Well, it's fascinating because your Twitter photo is the most intense photo of you, of you playing lacrosse. You're rugby. both uh, rugby. Ru rugby, my mistake. It's, both it's muscles, you know. You got it. Yeah, yeah, both intensely competitive, but also very kind and uh, and funny. Thanks. And you know. You you probably I think you have the most blab points of any podcast ever. We've, you have a hundred times more than I do, nearly. So uh, that <laughs> is the it. that is the indicator. It's, Usually, it's, it's about equal. It's sympathy for all my coughing. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Right, uh, thanks, you guys. Great uh, to meet you all. We'll see you. Bye. Bye. Okay, everybody. It's been another episode of Product Hunt Live. Thank you all for your fantastic questions and involvement. Uh, thank you for Blab for building such a fantastic platform. Thank you for uh, Lucas, Andreas, Mike, uh, all the engineers uh, at Product Hunt that worked on this to make this a possibility for everyone who asked questions. Uh, let us know who else you want on Product Hunt Live. Tweet at us at Product Hunt Live. Uh, uh, Neve masters the, the, the Twitter handle and feel free to tweet at me at Eric Tornberg and let us know who you want uh, on Product on Live next time. Feel free to tweet at that other person who you want to, to social proof, social pressure. Uh, I believe we have Kevin Jonas coming on very soon, if not today. No, not, maybe not today, maybe tomorrow. Uh, let me check. Kevin Jonas coming on soon. Also, Jack Dorsey is coming on next week. That's gonna be crazy. Um, and yeah, we have a lot of, no, yeah, Kevin Jonas on right now. Oh my God. He, yeah, the, yeah, go watch Kevin Jonas, guys. Kevin Ryan is doing Kevin Jonas. Everyone go watch Kevin Jonas. Uh, and then from the Jonas Brothers. And then, um, yeah, we is going to be, we have an amazing schedule at ProductHunt.com slash live. Everybody, thanks for joining. Uh, thank you for your feedback as always. And have a great day. Product Hunt Live over and out.